Hello, this is IP Stories by 4IP Council, a podcast about innovation and intellectual property. Join us and you'll hear about the journeys through invention, creation, and IP understanding of our guests. I'm Fernanda. And I'm Marta. And we have with us today Professor Dr. Eleonora Rosati. Eleonora, would you tell our listeners about yourself and your career? Yes, thank you so much and uh, hello to the both of you. It is a pleasure uh, to be part of this uh, podcast. Um, so my career in IP uh, started uh, by accident, I would say, because when I was a student uh, at the University of Florence, uh, there was uh, not uh, uh, an IP dedicated course uh, that I could follow. And uh, I actually found out about copyright uh, by reading the newspaper. So I still remember and I still have that article. It was a Sunday morning. And uh, there was indeed uh, an opinion uh, by a professor of commercial law discussing uh, the challenges of copyright in the online age. And uh, for me, it was uh, really surprising uh, to find out uh, about uh, an area of the law that uh, appeared so interesting. Uh, it was concerned with technological advancement. Uh, it was about uh, protecting uh, objects that uh, I've always loved, uh, such as uh, books, uh, art, and so on. Um, so it was love at first sight and uh, I've never looked back uh, since then. So it has been a very happy relationship uh, for several years. <laughs> and after that, of course, I had the opportunity to start working in IP. I looked uh, for internships uh, uh, in IP departments of law firms. Uh, and then uh, I had the opportunity to indeed uh, uh, learn about copyright uh, first as a self learner and then uh, through courses uh, and then uh, my PhD and so on. I mean, to be honest, it is indeed a very fascinating world. And, and it's so funny how these things happen, that suddenly you bump into, um, you know, by coincidence, into this article and you're like, whoa. I think that uh, a common trait of uh, the people working in IP is indeed the, the fact that uh, when they encounter this area of the law, it immediately resonated with them on a personal level. So I don't think... Uh, that uh, anyone working in IP uh, can be left indifferent uh, by the objects that IP does protect, uh, whether it is uh, indeed as hobbies, uh, passion, uh, or um, broader interest outside of work. And that, I think, is a very nice feature of our profession. Yes, I tend to agree with you. And I was wondering if what attracted you to the world of IP, and particularly copyright and trademark, is exactly what they protected. So is the artistic works, is it the books or what attracted to the world of IP? But I think uh, that uh, it is a combination of uh, the two elements that emerged uh, from that article. Uh, that is uh, the fact that uh, copyright uh, is uh, first and foremost uh, an instrument of uh, technical and technological governance. Uh, since its very inception in the modern times, uh, it has been concerned exactly with that from the printing press, uh, uh, photocopying machine to the internet and now artificial intelligence. And so I, I found it very captivating on an intellectual level. And I also appreciated the, the broader societal importance of the relevant issues. And then, of course, the objects that are covered by copyright interest me on a personal level. So it was the perfect combination. As for trademarks, I, I think that we are, we are all constantly exposed to trademarks in our life. Um, the aspect that I find most interesting and fascinating is less conventional marks. Uh, so when there are shapes, colors, patterns that become indicators of origin, I find it particularly interesting to see how this transition happens and what steps and efforts need to be made to this end, often with a lot of difficulties. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. So now we know how it, everything has started. Um, and now I would like to know what is the main driver of your career nowadays? But I would say that it has... It has remained the same uh, since the very beginning. Uh, it is uh, a mix uh, of uh, curiosity and uh, personal um, engagement uh, with uh, relevant components. So, for example, uh, today, one of the biggest uh, topics of discussion is, of course, artificial intelligence. 
but uh, I would say that if I think uh, deep down uh, why I'm interested in it, uh, it is the same reasons why I felt uh, enticed uh, by the discussion of copyright in the online age. So it is a driver that has remained uh, throughout my career. And uh, this has led to another uh, very fortunate uh, feature for myself uh, that uh, I feel uh, rarely that what I have to do for work uh, is actually work. So it is something that I would be doing anyway because uh, I'm uh, uh, drawn uh, to these questions uh, and these aspects. And that uh, I find it uh, is a very nice thing for me and also luxury that uh, I'm feeling uh, grateful for. <laughs> I think it would be nice if we told our audience all the different jobs that you have. <laughs> because we haven't we haven't mentioned yet uh, that you are a full professor, right? That you also work um, as of counsel in the IP team um, for Bird and Bird. And I know also that you have another project that I will ask you about later. So. Um, you juggle quite a lot of things. Like, how how do you manage? How is like a normal week for you? But uh, I would say that uh, these different roles uh, that uh, that I've been uh, uh, having over the years uh, are all uh, related to each other, uh, and I find uh, that uh, they are not uh, compartmentalized. Uh, uh, aspects that they take care of, but they all interact with each other. So let's start indeed from the combination of practical work and academic work. Um, I feel quite strongly about the need for anyone in IP academia also to engage on a regular basis with stakeholders in the IP field, whether it is companies, whether it is individual creators. Uh, so. IP law is extremely case law driven and issue driven. So not having uh, any exposure to the practical side, uh, I think that it makes you worse as an academic and as a researcher in the IP field. Vice versa, uh, I think that it is important uh, if you also if you are an IP practitioner uh, to keep track of relevant developments and relevant discussions, uh, not only to Uh, solve uh, existing questions, uh, but also to anticipate uh, future questions and drive the discourse. Uh, that is what a good lawyer does, uh, no? uh, driving uh, the decision of a judge, uh, driving uh, a uh, change uh, at the policy or legislative level. Uh, so I find uh, that uh, uh, they've helped me um, develop the type of career that I had in mind. And then I would also add that uh, I find it extremely rewarding and important also to engage with the broader community that includes uh, uh, junior uh, or new members of the profession and by that I'm referring to students uh, I think it is very important also to engage with them uh, learn from them uh, and help them uh, develop uh, the type of career that they want for themselves last but not least uh, contributing for several years uh, to the blog IPCAT uh, has uh, certainly been a highlight for me I started in uh, 2012 uh, so it has been uh, a while and um, the reason why I was interested in that in the first place uh, was of course to improve uh, my written English but also to keep abreast of relevant developments and become part of a global community of readers, lawyers, public affairs professionals, judges, and so on. So I find that different roles have really been right for me. But of course, as I always tell my students, there is not a single way to do IP. So one needs to understand what is right for them and the type of career that they want to develop for themselves. There is not a right or wrong path. The only wrong decision is to choose to do something that is not right for you. That is the only thing that I feel that, that I am quite strongly feeling about. Yes, I tend to agree with you. IP is a very fascinating wor world, of course. Maybe I'm biased to say that. Uh, but could you tell us a little bit more about Fashion Law London? Mm, with pleasure. So Fashion Law London is an initiative that I co-founded with two colleagues. And as you know, Fashion Law is an emerging area of practice, study, research, etc. 
But of course, it doesn't exist as such. There is no such thing as fashion law as there is not entertainment law. So there are different areas of the law that affect this business sector. And for fashion law London, when we started it, um, we realized that, that the discussion of leg legal issues affecting the fashion sector uh, was mostly from the perspective of non-lawyers, so designers, um, fashion business people, and so on. But at the time, there was not really much dedicated to lawyers advising fashion companies working in the fashion sector and so on. So it was meant to fill this gap and create a space of discussions specifically for lawyers, and that is how it was born. I'm glad to see that a few years down the line, um, there are uh, growing uh, uh, groups of people uh, dedicated to fashion law. I often get contacted uh, by students who want to become uh, fashion lawyers. So I think uh, that uh, it is uh, another area in which uh, one can combine uh, personal and professional interest uh, because the subject matter is objectively uh, very appealing. Uh, of course, uh, it covers uh, several different uh, issues uh, and the legal questions need to be uh, tailored specifically on the, the specificities of this uh, sector. I'm thinking that maybe we should also do a webinar about that, <laughs> because <laughs> it is such an interesting subject as well. Um, and talking about webinars, um, I would like to also tell our listeners, you know, we can take this opportunity to announce that uh, you are going to be back uh, in September to give a webinar. In this case, will be about copyright and AI. Um, so perhaps, Eleonora, you could tell our listeners why they should register to this webinar. Okay, I don't want, of course, to impose uh, registration on anyone, but... Uh... What I found that I think is quite enticing is the following, that when we speak about copyright and AI, so far the discourse has mostly revolved around the two key issues. The first one is the one that emerged first, and it is a protectability considerations, whether these AI-generated outputs can be protected by copyright, etc., and then, of course, there is uh, the topical discussion right now, also driven uh, by uh, several pieces of litigation uh, regarding uh, training of AI systems uh, on third-party copyrighted content, uh, so whether and to what extent there might be liability and so on. Uh, the webinar is uh, based on a study that uh, I'm uh, just about to complete, uh, and uh, concerns uh, something uh, that I think is emerging. Uh, I've seen uh, some... Uh, literature published on this topic. There has been a case decided in China uh, not too long ago, but remains unexplored. And it is uh, concerned with the output phase, but not the uh, protectability questions. Instead, the work is about the liability for the use of AI tools that might be infringing someone else's rights. So we will be discussing uh, um, various questions. First, uh, what uh, copyright issues uh, come into the picture in the transition uh, from uh, input training to output generation, uh, what the test uh, for actionable reproduction is, uh, whether indeed uh, these uh, plagiaristic outputs uh, are relevant under copyright, uh, question of uh, liability allocation, who can be liable for these infringing acts, uh, and then also the topic of uh, exceptions to copyright, uh, who might be benefiting from them and under what conditions. So I think uh, that uh, this might be an opportunity also to discuss uh, these important issues uh, that uh, I feel uh, should occupy a greater part of the debate than what has been the case so far. Uh, that is necessary not only for uh, AI to develop uh, sustainably, but also to uh, make every stakeholder involved uh, understand what is at issue. And that is so, uh, no matter whether it is in the context of compliance and risk assessment, uh, licensing efforts, uh, or uh, contentious uh, scenarios. So you heard, um, <laughs> I think it's, it's a great opportunity to, to learn about all the, the different aspects that we need to consider. And, and I, of course, invite you all to, to join this webinar. Um, we will make sure to leave the link on, on the podcast so you can go ahead and take a look. Uh, speaking about 
AI, um, which has been very challenging for copyright uh, lawyers, I think in the in the last few years, I would say. Um, I would I would like to ask you a more personal question. What has been the biggest challenge you had to face up until this point of your career? I would say it's not AI, <laughs> not yet at least. Sure. Uh, <laughs> But for sure, uh, um, I mean, being Italian and having lived uh, in different places, uh, um, I would say that uh, a challenge uh, that, that, you know, in the end has been resolved uh, quite positively, but a challenge has been uh, to try and develop a career uh, that would feel right to me. So indeed, uh, as you, Marta, outlined, uh, I have uh, different jobs uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, that this uh, might feel uh, uh, curious, if not odd to some, uh, but uh, I felt uh, quite strongly that this is what I wanted to do. And uh, meeting uh, people uh, that would understand this uh, and would uh, appreciate uh, this would be a strength and not a weakness. Uh, in the end, I've been very lucky. So I've been able uh, to meet uh, people uh, that have uh, helped me develop this type of career, but it has not always uh, uh, been easy. So. Uh, if I can reflect back uh, on this uh, and uh, also, um, you know, tell something uh, to those uh, who are more junior and that are listening uh, to this uh, is uh, do not feel discouraged if what you want to do is not possible right away and uh, do not let others that don't know you and uh, don't know what you want to do tell you whether what you feel for yourself is right or wrong. In the end, the only right path is your path. And that is something that I've felt challenged about. I've had indeed the moments also of um, disappointment, but in the end, what matters is the overall trajectory. And that I feel is something that uh, I want to share with the uh, junior listeners uh, or also those uh, that uh, may want uh, to transition to a different type of career and so on. That's a great advice. And uh, being Italian as well, I live in Milan. So when we were speaking about fashion law, I was very comfortable with, with the topic, although I'm not specialized in fashion law. Uh, I believe this is great advice, especially looking maybe a while ago, people were not, maybe perhaps they were not so open-minded to someone that wanted to pursue uh, different careers at the same time, different paths at the same time, not exactly a career. But that yeah, this was great advice, so thank you. No, no, and also, of course, the fashion law, uh, still uh, we see some resistance uh, um, by people who perhaps uh, do not know better because uh, indeed it is not a shallow area <laughs> of the law at all. There are many very important issues that are at stake, not only protectability of uh, uh, fashion assets, uh, but also conditions of laborers, uh, uh, those in the manufacturing uh, plants, uh, but also fashion workers of various kinds, uh, from designers to models and so on. Uh, so I think uh, that uh, it is a very serious <laughs> legal area. And uh, despite that, uh, there are still uh, some uh, resistances that we are seeing. Absolutely. Yes, I think you, I also think you gave great advice. Um, and, and it is funny how, like, if you, if you are choosing a, a, a path that perhaps is not so common or that some people feel that it's not the, the right thing, like it's, it's, it's true that it's easy to feel like you are swimming against all this energy and, and yeah, like, of course it's good to be lucky, but I'm sure that also a big part was how much work and and strength you put into it so congratulations oh, but, thank you i don't know if i am to be congratulated but uh, indeed the point you made uh, about uh, not giving up uh, and uh, having the drive needed uh, to swim uh, <laughs> in this sea are indeed the uh, key points uh, nothing uh, comes easy uh, no matter what sector you are in yes exactly and I would like to ask you as well, um, you know, looking at all your achievements, um, what are you most proud of? 
But, um, I don't know if I can speak of achievements, but certainly uh, the aspects that have made me feel co content also about my professional choices uh, have been, of course, uh, the possibility to become part of um, quite a broad, if not global, IP community, and so be able uh, to exchange views uh, with several stakeholders, uh, uh, members of the judiciary, policy makers. Uh, so having also my ideas, uh, and uh, also having an impact uh, on uh, the direction of uh, relevant developments, especially in the copyright field. So that is something that I feel quite content about. Uh, and uh, I also find uh, that uh, uh, being part uh, of this broader discussion has been uh, very rewarding and something that I've learned uh, a lot from. And then the other aspect, uh, if I may say so, is uh, indeed uh, also supporting uh, many students uh, and junior professionals uh, um, achieve uh, their goals. So um, it is very rewarding to see students uh, who come to you with an interest for intellectual property, then being able to develop a career in this field and uh, take the direction that is right for them. So I found this uh, uh, a very nice uh, rewarding side of my activity as an academic. And what is the main piece of advice you give to artists and creators regarding IP? Okay, so I will not be able to advise them on the creative side of things, so that is on them. But from a legal standpoint, I would say the following that uh, today to be an artist, a creative person, etc., is not easy. Uh, we've all seen uh, indeed also the, um, the wages, the earnings, uh, how difficult it is uh, to make it in the creative sector. Uh, and I find that uh, it is important from an IP perspective to receive advice quite early on in one's own career. There are many pro bono clinics also for uh, creators and artists. So it is not necessary to think uh, this is going to cost me a lot. You can also get uh, some uh, free advice on uh, the importance of uh, registering your IP. That might be design rights, can be trademarks, uh, and uh, indeed also what it takes uh, to claim copyright protection. Second thing is when you sign a contract, uh, be well aware of what indeed you are agreeing to, because uh, sometimes uh, these contracts uh, are not really read in detail or even read at all. One is just happy that they are offered a deal, but I think it is key to understand exactly what is happening, because uh, then becoming discontent is not necessarily a stretch. It is actually happening quite often. Third point is to keep a good trail of uh, written information about what, what one is doing uh, and with whom. Because uh, sometimes I find that uh, these uh, uh, creators uh, exchange views with partners, friends, uh, um, and they don't do that uh, in a formalized uh, context such as a contract. So there are these exchanges uh, and then uh, as it happens often in life, uh, friendships ends, uh, um, relationships come to an end uh, and uh, um, there are then questions of who did what, uh, who came up with that idea, who created that. Uh, so um, copyright is an unregistered right uh, and I think it is key uh, to keep good trail of what happened when and with whom. So it might feel dry and boring, I understand that, but it might be very helpful should any question arise down the line. Sign your NDAs. <laughs> <laughs> or refuse to do so. <laughs> but know what you are indeed getting into. Yeah, I think that's so, that's so important. There are so many things that can happen that I think it's very clever to keep track of all these, as, as you mentioned. Um, we are reaching the end. I have one last question for you, Eleonora. And this is because at FRIP Council, we, we are also quite aware of the need to help students. And um, we have actually a lot of students listening. So they might be wondering, how does one become an IP expert? And I was wondering if you have any recommendations for them. 
Okay, that is a very nice question. Um, so how to become an IP expert? Of course, the starting point is to study IP and uh, be curious about IP issues. So IP is not all in the textbook that your professor has given you to study, and it is not just in the exam. Uh, IP is about uh, reading uh, relevant newspapers because there are IP relevant news uh, in the newspaper every day. So um, that uh, focus on uh, policy discussions, uh, read the relevant blogs uh, and uh, read, read, read the decisions. Uh, I think that that cannot be emphasized enough uh, because uh, when it comes to IP, it is uh, of limited relevance to know what the court X and Y decided in a case. It is more about uh, building, the, um, understanding the reasoning uh, because uh, this is what makes you a good IP lawyer. And then uh, if we um, link back to the discussion about uh, fashion law, I often hear uh, indeed receive requests, how can I become a fashion lawyer? I mean, if you want to work in fashion from an IP perspective, you must once again uh, specialize in intellectual property. And it is not uh, that because something is not a fashion case, that it is not uh, something that you must know. So get as broad knowledge as possible and keep abreast of the relevant discussion. As I also tell my students, uh, when it comes to indeed preparing oneself for one career, you have in essence three steps uh, that help you this transition. The first one is being a recipient of knowledge. So you must study and you must know indeed the relevant principles and rules. Then you can specialize in an aspect of IP that you feel more attracted to than others. And then you must become a provider of knowledge, you know? So from recipient to provider, and you can be indeed an active part of this discussion if you have read, read and read beyond the textbook, beyond the mandatory reading, and you are able indeed to turn this curiosity that drew to the IP in the first place into being a critical voice of the discussion. And by critical, I don't mean that you must criticize the IP system, but that you have your own ideas about what the right answer to relevant IP issues are. And that might be then used in the context of academic work, if that is what you want to become, for example, by doing a PhD, it is about advising your clients, uh, indeed uh, making them understand uh, the range of options on the table and being able to tell them what is likely to happen, what they must be thinking about, etc. But if you have not completed this transition, this is a step that you will not be able to take. So starting point is read, be curious, and also speak to people. So you must start creating your own network early on as a student. So go to events, many of them are free. If you, if you don't have any events in the place where you are studying or in your city, which is unlikely, but it might happen. There are many resources online, many events that are live to attend online. So do as much as possible of all these. That I think is necessary for your dream to become an IP lawyer to turn into reality. I think that's great. And, and I love the idea of the critical mind. I think that's so important. And of course, uh, to always start with knowledge. So uh, thank you so much, Eleonora, for giving all these great advice and sharing with us your experience. Um, it has been a real treat. And I really want to talk about that other webinar about fashion law. So, <laughs> so to be continued. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Eleonora. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to IP Stories by 4IP Council. Visit our website on 4IPCouncil.eu to find out more and check out the links mentioned during this episode. If you liked it, remember to share and subscribe.